Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Pepinella, and I am the program manager of Barcode Long Island and Barcoding US Ants. On behalf of Louise Bott, manager of the Urban Barcode Project. Hello. Allison Mayo, manager of the Urban Barcode Research Program. Good afternoon. And the entire DNA Learning Center DNA Barcoding team, I would like to welcome you to our virtual DNA Barcoding Symposium. Due to the ongoing pandemic, we are presenting our symposium virtually again this year. While we are disappointed that we are unable to host the symposium in person, we are excited to continue to incorporate new technologies that will allow us to celebrate the research accomplishments of our participants with a broader audience. If you have not done so already, we encourage you to view the posters for our student DNA barcoding programs at our dnabarcoding101.org website, as well as information about our different DNA barcoding projects and available resources. We want to commend teams for once again overcoming enormous obstacles this year to do research projects. Participants in our national community science effort, Barcoding US Ants, engaged in projects that were entirely remote, producing incredible data with virtual support and material kits mailed to their homes during the peak of the pandemic. Many teams from our student program struggled with remote or hybrid schedules. Sudden school closures and limited access to collection locations or lab and classroom space for sample processing. However, these teams found unique ways to overcome these challenges by working virtually together with teammates, processing samples from home when needed, and even developing projects to analyze environmental health in response to the pandemic. It's not an easy task to take on a year long research commitment under normal circumstances, but to rise to this challenge during a pandemic is truly inspiring. As always, our mentors were prepared to adapt at a moment's notice and creatively guided students, not only through the struggles of executing a research project during this unique time, but through technological and emotional barriers as well. Mentors, your desire to foster cr critical thinking, your enthusiasm for problem solving, and the time and devotion you put towards this program is made abundantly clear year after year. And we thank you for the great work that you do. And of course, it is the support given an example set by parents, family, and friends that help to show these students what they are capable of accomplishing, even under the most challenging of circumstances. As in previous years, we are thrilled to see so many students taking an active interest in science research and environmental study. DNA barcoding has roots at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where in 2003, the first barcoding meeting was held at CSHL's Banbury Center. Attending scientists were wondering if it were possible to use a certain region of DNA to identify an organism in the same way in which a supermarket scanner uses a UPC code to identify a product. It turns out that not only is it possible, but it works pretty well. In just over 15 years, this discipline has evolved to inform major advances in health fields, as well as consumer and environmental protection. It has become an important tool to understand and restore ecosystems, monitor the loss of biodiversity, slow the spread of invasive organisms, survey vectors for disease, track changes in a species range, and reconstruct evolutionary histories, as well as provide governments with information to create better policies for environmental protection, to track climate change, to combat poaching, to guide health regulations, and more. Metabarcoding, a rapid and high throughput method of DNA-based identification of multiple species, has also made its way into the community science scene in recent years due to its integrative approach to the study of global biodiversity. Metabarcoding applications are seemingly endless from the study of the microbial composition of soil, as you'll learn about in today's keynote address, to the monitoring of marine life, or to the linking of interactions between humans and their microbiomes to health-related outcomes, as is the motivation behind the National Institute of Health's Integrative Human Microbiome Project. Participants, the work that you are doing is part of a valuable community science effort, and you should be extremely proud of your accomplishments. 
We'd like to say a big thank you to the DNA barcoding team, especially our executive director, David Miklos, as well as the entire DNALC staff for all of their work in the continued development and successful execution of our DNA barcoding programs. Thank you to all of our collaborators for hosting events, recruiting participants, facilitating sample collection, and providing scientific support. And finally, a big thank you to our funders without whom our programs would not be possible. Before we get started with our keynote address, we'd like to remind our audience that you can submit questions for our speaker through the YouTube chat during the presentation. You will need a YouTube account to log in and chat. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. It is my privilege to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Javier Izquierdo, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biology at Hofstra University. Dr. Izquierdo holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Case Western Reserve University and earned a PhD in microbiology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst where he investigated the diversity of microbes involved in nitrogen cycling processes in agricultural soils and the response of these communities to environmental disturbance. Current research in Dr. Izquierdo's lab explores the diversity of microbial metabolic processes and the applications we can derive from them. His research utilizes cross-disciplinary approaches incorpor incorporating microbiological, ecological, evolutionary, molecular and genomic techniques to understand beneficial plant microbiome interactions, promoting plant growth and health, as well as discover novel microbial applications for the production of biofuels and bioproducts. We are excited to have him here with us today. Welcome, Dr. Izquierdo. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the very, very nice introduction, Dr. Papanella. And thank you to, to the, the whole team at the DNA Learning Center and to Dr. Papanella for the invitation to be here today. I've been a fan of the, this initiative of the, of the different projects that you guys have, I see it from the distance and I've, I've never uh, seen it this close. So I'm very excited about, not only about talking today to you about a little bit about what we do in my lab, but also about um, what you guys are going to be showing in your poster session. So I'm gonna come by and visit and try to see as many posters as I can. Uh, this is a fantastic initiative for all of you to get introduced. And I think uh, it was also very nicely summarized at the beginning, how important it is to continue these projects, even in uh, the times that we have all faced over the past year, year and a half, right? It's been challenging, it's been challenging for everybody. It's been challenging for uh, people at Cold Spring Harbor and all, at all the universities that, uh, that do similar work to what these projects that you guys have been doing. Uh, it has been a challenge for all of us to continue, but it's been, great to be able to continue. So um, I'm excited to hear um, that, that this has continued through the pandemic and that we'll be able to see those uh, projects later on today. Uh, and without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and tell a little bit about what we do uh, as promised. And let's see, are we seeing the big screen or the little notes screen? I'm trying to see which one are you? You're seeing the big screen, you're good excellent. to go. Great, excellent. Uh, so, as uh, uh, promised, we were going to be talking about understanding, deconstructing, and rebuilding microbiomes to make a better world. That's kind of our, our mission in this Kyoto Lab. It's the, uh, the mant our mantra. Uh, that's what we set out to do. We have a bunch of different projects that sort of have this uh, in common. They, uh, we try to understand microbiomes or microbial communities by taking them apart and then putting them back together. And usually we try to understand those in a context that uh, provides something useful to us and to the environment. And that kind of fits a little bit with some of the projects that uh, all of you have been involved in. So that's a little bit of what you'll be seeing. Uh, and there's a, here's a little bit of, uh, if you are on Twitter or on Instagram, that's uh, our address here for the lab. You can get to see a little bit of what we do over there as well. And there's, we also have a webpage if uh, you wanna find out a little bit more about the projects that we have in uh, my lab. But as I promised, let me see what's going on. There we go. Um, something that we, I try to, we try to understand uh, these microbial communities as these very complex systems, right? Microbial communities tend to be in soil environments or inside of your gut. They tend to be important to that particular environment, but they're also 
very complex. They're very convoluted. They have components that are going to be very tricky to understand. And what we try to do to understand such a complex system is to take it apart, to understand it as a whole. And that's something where barcoding and meta barcoding becomes very handy. Uh, we pick usually marker genes that are important, whether it's a functional gene um, as in, that might be involved in an important functioning soil like nitrogen fixing or something more general, something that is shared by all organisms like the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. That's a very common gene to use. And that's something that helps us understand a whole microbiome or a whole microbial community as a whole. But something that we try to do in my lab is also to take that apart, understand the whole, but understand also what's happening in those little components. Uh, so try to get to some of these isolates or be able to grow some of these organisms in the lab. And eventually what we try to do is try to come back to the whole, right? Or, or a reconstructed whole, a reconstructed microbiome. Not necessarily a full picture of what we had before, but try to understand based on our understanding of the full community and of who some of the key players are, what happens at the level of a reconstructed community? How are these organisms interacting? So that's a little bit of what we're gonna be talking about today. Oh man, I keep on jumping back and forth. Okay, sorry. Um, and something that we do in my lab, a big project in my lab has to do with this organism that if you're a resident of Long Island or, or any uh, area around the, the Atlantic coast, uh, you are relatively familiar. You might have seen it. You might have walked by it. You might have ignored it. Uh, this is beach grass. This is uh, a, the American beach grass, which is a very interesting organism, even though it looks like it's just everywhere growing on sand. It's something that people tend to overlook. But we have uh, fallen in love with this plant as an organism that uh, a larger organism, um, not a microbe necessarily, but uh, a larger organism that hosts an interesting microbiome. Uh, but the organism itself is very interesting, uh, and, and it, the, some of the properties that it has uh, make its microbiome as well very interesting. So this is the plant. This is when it starts growing at the beginning of the season. Uh, the American beach grass, is, the scientific name is Amophila breviligulata. Amophila is the genus name. There's a couple of uh, species within the genus Amophila, and that just means that it loves sand environments. And that's, it definitely does that. It grows very well, very, very well in those environments. And it tends to grow very quickly, uh, two to three feet tall within, uh, and, and seeds will start appearing towards the uh, mid, late summer. And it's also a very important, uh, it's considered a very important June architect in Bear Islands. It colonizes uh, Bear Islands and it also traps sand in its leaves. It has very, has very strong leaves to capture sand and also an extensive root system that allows it to stand very well against all the stresses that it would face as one of these first colonizers in uh, what would be otherwise um, uh, just sand. And so it has all these different interesting adaptations that allow it to not only grow on a very challenging environment, but also to promote the formation of dunes, which are important for creating ecosystems within bare islands um, and also creating those, the, the, the dunes, the protection for those bare islands. One of the key features that it has is, uh, is this very extensive root system. And this is an early uh, beach grass, so this is just starting to grow, but it's already starting to form this long extensive, this long extensive root system that allows it to um, to withstand um, being ripped away from, from uh, the sand dunes. And as despite all the advantages that it has, all the success that it is, uh, that it is able to have growing in this environment, it also has its challenges. So for example, it's gonna have some predators that vary. So this is a picture taken here uh, at Jones Beach on Long Island, and uh, it has a variety of predators that include deer, but also rabbits. Uh, if you go a little bit further down the Atlantic coast, uh, it might be horses in uh, some of the, the bare islands on North Carolina. And they present a challenge to the plant, but not a dramatic challenge. There are bigger uh, challenges to the plant and challenges to the whole environment. Uh, like this picture, this is one of the few pictures that I haven't taken, so I'm putting a little bit of the photo credit in here. Um, uh, this is Superstorm Sandy viewed from above. And 
uh, as you know, that this is a major, uh, this is a major event that, that had major consequences to our whole community, but also uh, destroyed a lot of the, the dunes and bare islands along the coast, not only here, but um, all over the Atlantic coast. And a way of bringing this back uh, is, uh, and there's multiple ways of bringing this back, but one of the ways of bringing this back is relying on the success of Beechcrest itself. So Beechcrest colonizes and recolonizes. This is a picture from Cedar Beach from a few years ago. And you can see how there's some uh, dunes that have already reformed here after Sandy that have been successfully growing over the years. And this is actually brand new growth of that particular year that it's growing at floor level. So right behind me, you would expect to see a little bit of the water uh, coming in from the beach. And uh, this is a, a dune in early stages of formation. So this is something that is uh, areas that are, you, you might see areas that are protected. Uh, you might see signs on the beach that say, please do not step on the dunes. That's what this is all about. Protecting this area so that beach cars is allowed to uh, recolonize. And the other way is uh, these replanting events that my lab and uh, members of the Department of Biology uh, have been able to get a lot of people to get involved in this. Uh, these are usually done, are done by different towns along the area. Some of you might, be, might have been able to participate in some of these, but we are able to replant beach grass in some reconstructed dunes. So these are dunes that are not formed naturally, but are formed um, by plowing a lot of dune, uh, a lot of um, sand on a particular area and stabilizing that dune by replanting uh, these beach grass on those dunes. And these have generally a mixed effect. So they, they tend to have, uh, some of them are gonna be very successful in growing, some of them are not gonna be very successful growing. You can see that in this picture. So this is all replanted beach grass and some of it is, has grown very well. This is towards the end of the summer. Some of it has grown very well, but some of it has not grown uh, very well. And usually when I see this, I tend to think about, well, this is some, something that has to do with the plant, but uh, as a train, somebody that was trained in soil microbiology, I tend to think about well, what's going on underground, right? Uh, and something that is very interesting about beach grass is that we don't know a lot about the microbes that are associated with it. Uh, there, This is a picture that we took in my lab and I've, these are, this is all colored um, with Photoshop. So these are not real colors of bacteria, but um, we've been, this is a scanning electron microscope, uh, looking at these different morphologies that you see associated with the root of the plant. So there's a microbiome associated with the root of every single organism uh, or every single plant, right? Every single plant organism. And we are interested in seeing, well, what's, what could provide with some of the benefits that the, the beach grass uh, might have uh, through, through its microbiome. And it's very well known that microbiomes have a, may play a major role uh, and microbial microbiome and plant relationships and micro plant relationships play a key role in many, many aspects of the plant's survival. So for example, nitrogen fixation happens not only in environments that don't have a lot of nitrogen, but also in environments that have uh, a lot of nitrogen. It's a key process that allows uh, plants to obtain nitrogen uh, from nitrogen gas. Uh, so other uh, aspects that uh, microbes are generally involved in are iron sequestration for the plant, uh, solubilization of phosphate, uh, phosphate that is not generally soluble is going to be solubilized by microorganisms and some of their enzymes that allow them to um, make that phosphate available to the plant. Uh, also some plants, some organisms in order to have a relationship with the plant, uh, per, uh, in enhance the, the growth of the root by the production of uh, oxings or plant hormones. So there's all these different benefits that microbes and, and microbiomes provide at the root level. And that's something that we wanted to look at. So a little bit of what I'm gonna be telling you next is a little bit of a story uh, divided into these portions that we have already talked about, talking about the whole microbiome, looking at some of the building blocks and then where we're going with that in the future. So something that we set out to understand about the beach grass microbiome per se is, some of these basic questions, who is there? What are they doing? So a little bit of the, what is the microbial community composition of um, the, uh, the beach grass microbiome, but not only based on these markers, kind of like the markers that you're using like 16S, but also look, being able to grow some of those organisms in the lab and understand those organisms in the lab uh, to see what they can do for the plant. 
And that goes a little bit more into the next question, right? From those organisms, which ones are producing compounds that uh, enhance growth? Which ones are produce, which ones might be able to protect the organism, the plant, uh, the host organism from pathogens? Are there organisms that have a completely different effect, right? So organisms that are uh, that are not not beneficial but are uh, pathogenic, for example. And we've collected samples all along the, the South Shore and along, along the Bay Islands of uh, Long Island and been able to compare not only wild and healthy plants, but also some of the replanted plants that I showed you that are either healthy versus unhealthy. And a lot of what we do is collect samples uh, from the root, uh, divide those samples from samples that are soil that is in between the plants versus soil that is directly attached to the plant and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but also collect some of the plants themselves, right? And understand what's happening inside of the root. A lot of these organisms, a lot of the microbiome actually exists within uh, the plant. So what's happening inside of the root as well. And for that, we're doing, I already uh, mentioned a little, bit, a little bit about this, we're doing a lot of Illumina sequencing for 16S or somal RNA, doing a little bit of this meta barcoding um, it, it, and it's, it gets to be very complex, right? Because the diversity in these environments is very broad. It's, it's mind boggling sometimes. Uh, in an environment even as depleted as sand, you can find anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000 microbial species in just a tiny little sample that is about one gram. So we need something like uh, this uh, 16S ribosome RNA and Illumina sequence that allows us to get about 20,000 different sequences, between 20,000 and 100,000 sequences per soil sample to see who is actually there. And then we also use the same samples to get to those building blocks to isolate some of these uh, individual organisms. And we'll talk a little bit about those later on when we we'll talk about building blocks. So the samples that we've been collecting have been not only from the soil surrounding the plant, but also this soil that is attached to the root uh, that is known as the rhizosphere is the, the area that is of, of that particular soil environment that is directly attached to the root and what is known as the endosphere that is the inside, inside of the root. So you'll be hearing a little bit about that all, over the, all throughout the talk. Um, and something that we have found is that the microbiome is very structured in this environment. So regardless of where we sample, so these are sample sites um, that where we sample bulk soil, rhizosphere and endosphere, we find that this, the community composition tends to be very similar for the rhizosphere and for the endosphere and very different for the bulk soil. So this is depend in samples that are pretty far away from each other. And yet we're finding patterns of similarity between those soils and uh, compared to the soils that we consider to be the rhizosphere, but it's the environment directly attached to the root and the endosphere. And we tend to see some of the similar groups like this flavobacteria that are showing up more, for example, in the endosphere. We see increases in fibrobacteria when we, you talk about both uh, root environments. So that's happening here with these green blocks that you're seeing here. And these are larger taxonomic groups. So out of the thousands of species that we have there, we have grouped them into uh, phala, into order, class. And you're seeing here just larger taxonomic groups, not species level yet, because that would be very, very thin bars in this graph representing 100% of the diversities there that is there. This is just the proportions of those sequences that correspond to a particular taxonomic clade. So a lot of overlaps between the root environments and they're very different from the bulk soil. Um, when we look at this, this is a, a principal components analysis. This is a, a two-dimensional representation of all of the diversity that we have in each of these samples. Each one of these plot of, of these dots represents, or the symbols represents, a an individual sample that is either bulk soil, endosphere, or rhizosphere, either from a healthy, unhealthy, or wild sample. And something that we're seeing here, we're, we're trying to see based on the genetic data that we're obtaining. Uh, and the proportions of that diversity that is present. If we place this in this, um, this two-dimensional representation of that diversity, where do they place? What, is, what, what are the closest relationships between them? And something that we have found here is that endosphere and rhizosphere, as we noted just at the larger taxonomic level, are much more closely uh, tied to each other, right? That there's 
uh, bulk soil is over here and that endosphere and rhizosphere tend to have uh, quite a bit of similarities in here. We're not finding a lot of differences between healthy, unhealthy, and wild when we're looking at this whole sample, this whole bigger set of samples. But if we divide it into the individual environment, we get to see a little bit more of a differentiation between healthy, unhealthy, and wild. Uh, mostly that the healthy and unhealthy, surprisingly, but maybe not, are more similar to each other. There's a little bit more overlap with one another, that's the purple and yellow in this graph, uh, than there is with the wild. The wild tends to be a little bit further away, a little bit more uh, differentiated. And that, that might have to do more with the origin of these plants, right? So the wild tends to be a clonal growth of those plants that have been allowed to grow and develop for a while, whereas all these healthy and unhealthy plants have been introduced by us or by park services being uh, replanted on these sites. So that's pretty interesting um, in terms of just a general characterization of what's happening in these microenvironments and what's happening with healthy and unhealthy, that there's actually a little bit of distinction between healthy and unhealthy, but also more so with uh, what grows in the wild. And we were also interested in looking at, uh, in, in the sites where we looked at healthy versus unhealthy, what organisms were more prominent present in one environment versus the other, right? In, in healthy versus unhealthy, or what organisms were more dominant in each one of those situations. And that's uh, summarized in this figure, which of, of course you can read very well. No, I'm, I'm, that's a joke. That's, this is a very complicated figure that the only thing that I want you to take is looking at the most the genera that change the most. Out of hundreds of genera, these are the 57 that actually change the most. And the ones that I want you to care most about, the ones that are more towards the blue, are uh, the genera that are more abundant in uh, healthy plants, and in red, the ones that are in more abundant in unhealthy plants. And as you can see, even though we have simplified a very complex data set into uh, a slightly less complex data set, which is what I'm showing you here, it's still very complex, right? And there's still a lot of these species that go up in some situations and down in some situations, uh, or not species, but genera. So a way of simplifying this is to look at what are the genera that are consistently across different sites. So these are two different sites, Tobe Beach and Cedar Beach, um, across every single environment, which ones are found to be more abundant or less abundant. Those are the ones that are uh, completely blue across the board, like we see this guy right here, this Veruca microbium, or uh, completely red across the board, like this streptomyces that shows up down here. And something that we found is that in healthy environments, there were three genera that were the most, uh, that were significantly more prevalent in all of the soil microenvironments. And these are these Mucilaginibacter that tends to be associated with plants. We didn't know anything about Mucilaginibacter and, uh, and beach grass up until this point. Uh, Veruca microbium that are very interesting organisms that are recently considered a new, recently in the past 10, 15 years, um, a, a new clade in the bacterial tree of life. And the one tricky part about this is that they're very tricky to grow in the lab. And then phytoplasma, which shares something with Veruca microbia that is an organism that is uh, generally only allow, it only grows inside of the plant host. Uh, so that's a little bit of where, where it gets its name. It's an organism that has a, a very interesting, a different type of cell wall or no cell wall, those are plasmas, and phyto for plants. So it's an organism that, and most of them tend to be pathogenic, but we're finding some phytoplasmas that are tend to be uh, present here more, uh, more or more prevalent in uh, plants that are healthy. And there are also a couple of other uh, genera that we uh, that are, are of interest that are either higher in soil environments or higher in the rhizosphere environment or higher in the endosphere environment. And similarly, on the unhealthy side the, or the unhealthy plants, the organisms that were most um, prevalent in all root microenvironments were uh, these for, uh, organisms from the actinomycetes. Um, and actinomycetes tend to be um, more, there's also a couple of actinomycetes here that are specific to particular groups that most of these uh, of, of the matches that we found uh, were associated with organisms found in desert soils or uh, that were associated with plant pathogens. So there are some 
clear trends in here of organisms that are like Mucilaginibacter that tend to have um, beneficial relationships with the plant and are more prevalent in those healthy uh, replanted uh, beach grass versus these uh, more pathogenic uh, actinomycetes that we found in the unhealthy plants. And we've also been looking at these, I showed you this picture before, we've been looking at these uh, dunes that we call primary, secondary, and tertiary, uh, based on how close they are or how early they are in their development. Um, uh, we have been looking at them over time, and that's something that uh, a student of mine, Josh Pimentel, did for um, three, three years. Yes, he had data for three separate years. Uh, he had data for more. That's why I'm just cutting it at down, down to three. Three is what we fully analyzed. Um, and something that he did there was to find organisms that were consistently found in those primary or early stages of the dune or secondary stages of the dune that were consistently found uh, throughout uh, that time. And he found that the, the ones that he found all the time in there that were repeated year after year after year, where again, Mucilaginibacter and also Rhizobium, which is known to be a nitrogen fixer. So two uh, genus of organisms that we know have um, beneficial interactions with the plant uh, showed up not only in this analysis here, but also in the previous analysis as key genera uh, when looking at the full community level and changes that happen at that community level. So as, as I promised before, we wanted to look also at building blocks. And that's something that students in my lab have also been doing and started with these two students, Sherry and Bobby. Uh, this is Sherry isolating a lot of, making mountains of plates with different organisms. And uh, we've been able to collect a whole variety of organisms that have all kinds of different properties. One of them is how much of this particular plant hormone, uh, indoacetic acid, they produce. That's something that's an assay that we can do in the lab after we have grown an organism. Uh, we give it a particular amino acid and see if they're able to turn it into this plant hormone. And a lot of them are able to make uh, a lot of it. So out of many isolates that we screened, we found that um, only 27 isolates that we obtained put, produced uh, a significant amount of uh, and that is higher than 100 micrograms per, per mil of this uh, plant hormone. And the rest of them made just this uh, very lower range of that particular. That doesn't mean that they're not interesting. That just means that in terms of those, uh, this particular property, uh, that they, they were not, they, they did not make this cut. But we're also looking for other properties that they might have. Uh, so a lot of these organisms make siderophores. This is growing them on a plate in which uh, if they collect, if they sequester iron, um, they are able, they're able to remove it from the medium. And that's what this blue label, uh, that, so this is iron that has been uh, bound to a, 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 a compound that is uh, with a blue dye. And if you see areas of, uh, or the zones of clearing around the cell or around the colonies, uh, that means that those organisms are sequestering that particular uh, compound. So that's something that is an, a nice easy assay that we have been able to do uh, that allows us to also identify which ones of these organisms are doing that. And this is another one that is a lot of fun. So this is usually what happens when we start trying to isolate organisms. You have a lot of different organisms with different colony shapes, morphologies. Some of them are gooey. Some of them are a little bit more difficult to collect. Uh, some of them are not gonna grow. So a lot of, usually we're able to grow a very low percentage, somewhere between one to 5% of the organisms that are in a particular environment. So, and yet you still have this broad diversity of cells or types of colonies that are growing. But you might notice something interesting here in these particular areas that are very perfectly circular where these colonies are growing. It looks like these organisms right here, these colonies right here, have dropped the equivalent of some sort of atomic bomb all over the place, uh, clearing the areas around them. And now with a little bit of help of these circles, you might actually be able to see a little bit of that. But there's organisms that are producing antibiotics among these isolates. So that's another category of organisms that we've started to collect. We've, so we've been assembling this collection of organisms that have all these different properties that are of interest and see what we can learn about them. Um, something that we also did started later on was also with our un understanding that Mycelogenibacter is uh, an important species in this environment is to obtain um, Mycelogenibacter 
uh, isolates from this environment. And some of them have some of those properties that I've been mentioning before. But this is more of a targeted approach of looking at those particular isolates or looking at that particular genus based on the information that we got from the full community. And little by little, we've started assembling these collection of organisms that are very useful. Some of them have uh, natural fixing proper properties. Some of them are very good at uh, increasing the or producing that, um, that uh, plant hormone that I mentioned before. Some of them have a combination of those. Some of them belong to those groups that we're interested in, like Mucilaginibacter. And we've been testing some of them as individual uh, organisms on a greenhouse that we have at Hofstra, in the, in, in, at Hofstra University in, on the roof and looking at uh, if we can see differences in growth as we inoculate some of these plants or plants in early development with, um, uh, with uh, this organism. And here's two very quick versions of that data. So this is studying something that is useful for beach grass, but just because it's useful for beach grass doesn't mean that it's not useful for other organisms. So if we started testing, expanding our host organisms, working with other uh, grasses that are of interest and some of our isolates have, uh, so this is, this is strain AW4, for example, that uh, we're very interested in because this is early development of switchgrass. Switchgrass is a grass that is able to grow on very marginal soils, very poor environments, but it's used as a bioenergy crop or it's being proposed to be used as a bioenergy crop. So in early development in just uh, growing uh, switchgrass from seed, this is very early growth. We can see the development of roots with uh, that have been inoculated with or seeds that have been inoculated with strain AW4 to be much higher than what we find uh, with an, in, an inoculated control. Uh, so that can be seen in terms of the root, but we also see the opposite with this other, uh, in terms of the, the density of the, the upper biomass, so not just the root, but also the shoot. That's what this shoot length is all about. Uh, this is a different organism and different isolate HGC 102 that is very good at increasing the, the bulk biomass, the top biomass or the upper biomass in these plants. Uh, and we've seen similar results here. Uh, this is with wheat. Um, this is a different grass, but a grass that we, a lot of us eat and that provides a lot of sustenance for a lot of the world. And we're seeing how some of these isolates are also increasing not only the root biomass, but also increasing the shoot biomass uh, of these plants. So that's uh, something that we're very excited about. And we've uh, sequenced the genome of AW4. We have also, with the collaboration of the Department of Energy and the Joint Genome Institute, we've sequenced the genomes of 48 other uh, promising isolates, including some of these key players that I've been telling you about. So we're shaping up to build this, to go back to that, the, that the future that I talked about, right? To assembling these components into these reconstructed microbiomes and being able to understand them in their environment with a little bit of this information, a little bit of this genome information. So these are some of the, the, the general conclusions that we've gotten here in terms of understanding that the microbiome is structured, uh, understanding how different healthy and unhealthy are in terms of specific species, um, but also what organisms are important in terms of the early stages of growth of beach grass. And now we have also have moved to not only understanding how some of these isolates uh, promote plant growth for beach grass, but also for other plant hosts and what other applications they have. And uh, very briefly, I'll tell you another quick story about uh, work that I started a long time ago and on biofuels. These are my two uh, kids as they are trying to shove a little bit of grass onto a toy car. That's what we have right there. Uh, that's a, a, a very nice summary of what my work was or has been for the other half of the lab for a long time, which is turning plant biomass into some sort of fuel or some sort of biofuel. Um, so we have, usually you have to turn, go through this process of turning plant biomass into sugars and then having something that ferments it into ethanol. And we don't understand this process very well from sugars to alcohol, but we don't have something that does this in one single step very well. So we have produced a similar story in our lab uh, that works with, that has different components or some of these different uh, 
components of having a key cell integrator, uh, a bioplastic producer, so expanding not just from biofuel, but also to a, uh, bioplastics, and also a specialist that I'll tell you about in just a second. Sharon, just to check, how much time do I have left? You have about five minutes or so. Perfect. I can, yeah, I can, I can squeeze this in there. Um, so something that we work in my lab with is high temperature organisms. This is a compost pile that is around 160 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, a little bit over. And those are great environments for cellulose degraders to grow very quickly and usually starts as something very dirty that came from the compost pile, but eventually becomes a pure culture after multiple transfers. It becomes a, multi, a pure culture that is able to grow on cellulose only. And from this type of work, we've been able to isolate organisms like this strain 42A that is a clostridium organism. It grows at very high temperatures. That's 55 to 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and also under anaerobic conditions so that they are able to uh, ferment. And these organisms are specialized with enzymes on their cell walls that allow them to not only chew plant material, the very complex polymers of plant material and plant cell walls, but also because they're under anaerobic conditions, they go through fermentation. So they have all these enzymes that allow them to break these polymers apart. And they have other enzymes that allow them to break those, the, the remaining polymers into single units. And compared to the competition, so this is our strain 42A, most other organisms, including this Clostridium thermosolum, that is a model organism in the production of biofuels, it's able to take this complex polymer of hemicellulose, that is five carbon sugars, and able to break it down, not only into the individual sugars, which is what is shown here, but also all the way to fermentation products. So it's able to use those fermentation products. And we have sequenced the genome of the organism, found that it has genes that are able to, that enable it to process uh, that, uh, the, those sugars like cellulose isomers, cellulose kinase, and to be the only organism in this group of model organisms that are thermophilic, that's marked in red, that are able to grow not only on cellulose, but only on uh, hemicellulose, which allows it to use a lot of the plant. We've been hunting for other organisms that we can put in there. And by hunting, if you want to go hunting, you go, no, you don't go to the zoo. Uh, that's where we've been going to uh, get samples to get some of these microbes. And this is an anaerobic glove bag that we use to collect some of these organisms. And we've been able to get, again, complex my community my or microbiomes from the guts of organisms like the okapi that is shown here. And from that work, these two students, Justin and Dasi, were able to obtain some communities that have this high proportion of this organism that is called Clostridium thermosuccinogenes. We've been able to isolate it. And it's an organism that produces succinate in high amounts, but it's an organism that produces succinate in conjunction with other organisms that break down cellulose. So now, not only do you have organisms that are making cellulose and making ethanol as a potential biofuel, but something that makes uh, also uh, succinic acid or succinate that can be used as a precursor for uh, bioplastics. So we have something else in this combination of organisms that allows us to uh, integrate into this biorefinery idea. And last but not least, this is a, a brand new story that we're, we're playing with is this idea of a, a specialist. We have, um, we have started working with willow uh, or the willow tree. Willow grows in very marginal lands all over, and also it's grown here in New York uh, in many places where it doesn't interfere with agriculture so that we can grow large amounts of these biomass. But it's very difficult to break down and to turn into a fuel. So individual organisms tend to do a relatively decent job with it, but communities or microbial communities together tend to make uh, or be able to degrade much more of that particular um, uh, biomass or biomass feedstock. So that's something that we're starting to look at. This is a macro community that we're starting to dissect. And we're finding, you see that there's different names in here. That means that they have different origins, but it also means that there's different organisms that are playing a key role in increasing the ability of the degradation of that compound. So we're starting, we're trying to isolate that particular organism so that we can get to this story as well. So this is a little bit of the summary of my talk. It's a whole bunch of Avengers 
movies, right? This this is where we're getting at in most of my uh, of the projects in my lab. We've been collecting these, getting a good sense of what the whole community is, uh, collecting these great individual movies like Black Panther, like Thor, Spider-Man, all these different individuals. But we're finally getting to that point in which we're going to be able to say, okay, Avengers Assemble, get all these organisms together and see what they can do uh, to do something interesting for plants like beach grass, but also plants that we eat. Um, uh, or in the case of the other organisms that I just showed you, make, take organisms that work together to make not only biofuels, but also bioplastics or other useful compounds. Uh, something to make this world a better place in, in both sides of the story. And with that, I wanna thank uh, some of the funding agencies that have supported our work, particularly NSF and uh, the DOE through the JGI, uh, a lot of the collaborators that we have had uh, here and elsewhere that uh, uh, collaborate with this work, but also in particular, all the members past and present of the Iskiro Lab who have been crucial, who are the, the, the workers, the, the people at the front line doing all the hard work. And with that, I'll be happy to take some of the questions that will be on the chat. Well, excellent, uh, really cool research going on. Thank you so much. So we have had a number of questions come in, so I'll go ahead and we'll try to get to a few of them here. Um, so we had some people who wanted to know that after different storm events, uh, whether major or minor, or if there's a difference, have you been able to identify specific patterns in microbiome diversity? That's a great question. So we've been able to see, so we have a, another project going on right now in New Jersey, where there are all these areas that are, when there's, um, the, there's blowout of the of a particular dune, how it gets recolonized, right? And how those patterns of diversity, depending on how major they are, um, they, how, how these organisms start or how the communities start developing again. Um, and what we have found is that the, the communities are very sensitive, right? So the, the changes that happen between being very close to being right on the rhizosphere are are major in terms of community composition. So if you disrupt that for the plant, it's gonna be very difficult for the plant to reestablish that community. Um, that's that's something that we're still sort of getting our head around, right? It's, it's more of a long-term project because it requires also having something else to compare it with. It requires having a couple of, of uh, as I was indicated, as was indicated in the question, we have to have uh, something with of lesser uh, or a lesser stress to see what happens in there. But yes, that's a, definitely a question that we're interested in. Excellent. Uh, someone else wants to know if you've considered expanding your um, microbiome workups to include uh, eukaryotes. So fungi, protozoa, mm -hmm. nematode yes. communities in bulk soil and rise of your micro microbiomes. Fantastic question. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, something that is actually very, very well known about um, beach grass, it's, it really, it's not very well known, but better known than, than bacterial relationships are its fungal relationships. Um, but there's very little that is known as the full, it's, it's known in terms of culturable fungi, fungi that you can grow in the lab and that you can count and identify, but not in terms of the full fungal microbiome um, or the, the microbiome in the case of the, the, the beach grass. So yes, that's definitely something that, that we're interested in looking at. We have our hands full already with uh, bacteria and archaea as it is. Uh, but if anybody knows of collaborators that are very good at um, understanding fungal microbiomes, happy to talk to them. Um, we, some of the work that we're doing on uh, New Jersey is also in conjunction with somebody that is very good at identifying uh, those fungi, not using molecular methods, but uh, other approaches. Um, but it's limited by the fact that it's it's not not as broad as it would be with a molecular approach. Okay, I think we have time for one more, and I think this is a good one to end on, uh, which is why did you want to explore this field? Ah, because well, the, the field as a whole um, is has always been a staggering question, uh, a, a question about staggering diversity, right, and about very Miss, very poorly understood potential of what we can do with microbes, how we can use microbes to do something better. Um, I started, I got into this and I got into my PhD program 
mostly out of working. So I'm originally from Venezuela. And uh, as a biologist, the only work that I got in Venezuela was uh, working for oil companies. Venezuela is uh, it's very rich in oil. Um, so I was trained as a biologist. I went home. The only job that I got was in that. And I, I just I became mesmerized by the ability of microbes to uh, convert compounds by biodegradation, by uh, all their the mineral capabilities that they had that we really didn't understand that it's a big, this big black box. None of the tools that exist right now were available then in terms of really understanding, fully understanding how a microbial community uh, plays a role or what are all the new enzymes that could be involved in a particular process that uh, do that. Uh, so a lot of the, the my, my interest has always been just looking at processes in nature and thinking about what are microbes doing in that particular environment that we don't see, right? And that is actually very useful to generate this, uh, this bigger picture that we get to be witnesses of. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Izquierdo for your excellent presentation and your time today. That's all thank the you. time we have uh, at the moment. Um, but uh, if anybody was having any sort of technical trouble at the beginning of the event, please do know that this is recorded so that you can come back and view the uh, entire presentation uh, on our website at a later time. Uh, so I just wanna take this opportunity to invite our viewers to check out our DNALC virtual content. Uh, so this includes information about our upcoming on-demand virtual and in-person summer camps, as well as our new Brooklyn DNAS, DNALC facility uh, that's at the website listed on your screen. Uh, and you can also follow us on social media. So at this time, we ask that symposium participants please enter the gather poster session space. If you have an odd numbered poster, you will be presenting now until 5.45 p.m. If you have an even numbered poster, you will be presenting from 5.45 to 6.30 p.m. When you are not presenting, please visit your colleagues at their posters and ask questions about their research. And Dr. Izquierdo will also be in the keynote room during the poster session from five o'clock to 5.15 p.m. And then again from 5.45 to 6 p.m. Uh, to answer any additional questions that you may have for him. So thank you very much everyone and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>